general semantics claims itself to be something of a biological science looking upon human beings in a biological kind of way. And the specific mechanism of survival for human beings is uh, not aggressiveness and ferocity as it is for beasts of prey, nor does it mean the ability to outrun enemies like the antelope or the deer. It doesn't mean protective walls around oneself, <laughs> building protective walls around like oneself like oysters or the tortoise. Fitness to survive among human beings, according to our definition, is the ability to organize communication cooperation and Korzybski called that the time-binding capacity. The word binding there is a very odd use of the word, but because what he meant was that plants are chemistry binding. They bind up chemicals for our next generation to start business. And human beings are space binding, or not, uh, animals are space binding, as if they run out of food in one place, they can move around and find it somewhere else. So they bind space, as he put it, the human beings are time-binding in the sense that uh, human beings have the ability to create language, the ability to systematize information so that it can be remembered and recorded and passed on to others. It means the ability to create societies which are essentially complex networks of communication. I, I find that, uh, that it's best to... Uh, to it's, uh, simplest to, to um, translate the term time binding by saying time bridging. Uh, so, he, and therefore human beings are not limited in social society to face-to-face -face groups as are the gibbon and the chim chimpanzee. Human beings can, can organize societies at great distances and over generations of time. And that peculiar characteristic of human beings, and is true of all human beings, is the specific survival mechanism of man, according to John Smack's point of view. And therefore, when human beings communicate with each other, whether with language or with jungle drums or with electromagnetic waves, they are behaving in a way specific to their species. And when human beings make use of science, of technologies, of ethical systems, of literature, and so on, they are using the accumulated insights, intuitions, and observations of thousands of fellow human beings, most of them long since dead. And human beings then add to their knowledge and techniques from generation to generation, so that each generation can start from where the last left off. And the time-binding capacity is but another name for the ability to create civilization. Now, See, the uniqueness of general somatic uh, philosophy or worldview is the statement of time binding or time bridging as a central biological mechanism that distinguishes us from other creatures on earth. And the cultural anthropologists have another name for this capacity. They call human beings culture bearers. You know, as bears are fur bearers and human beings are culture bearers. And, but when you think of, of, of culture bearing or time binding as the, the specific human attribute, it's interesting to think about. Even the most primitive of human beings speak languages with incredibly rich vocabularies and complex grammatical systems, languages inherited from earlier generations. Also inherited by all human beings are their beliefs, myths, rituals, tools, skills, and patterns of social organization. There, I wonder if you've ever thought about ancestor worship as a form of time binding. See, before the invention of writing, how, do you, how are you going to pass down the wisdom of the ancestors? Well, you have to tell people that the ancestors are very, very sacred. They're the people from whom we are all descended. And because they're sacred, you've got to remember what they said. <laughs> And so this, this sacredness then is a way of making a directive to, to tell you to remember all the messages from the past so you will be able to pass them on to the future. And this business of the sacredness of ancestors, I think, is a, an ingenious kind of communication mechanism guaranteeing the 
or more or less guarantee the accuracy of communication from generation to generation. And, and, and I suppose that before the invention of writing, mm -hmm. ancestor worship was about a good way that there was of passing down cultural information over time. Now, there's one respect in which the cultural anthropologist's definition of man as culture bearer and man, and the general semantics their definition of man as time binder, there's one respect in which they differ. The time binding formulation regards progress as inevitable and normal if time binding is going on properly. That is, if there are no cultural inhibitions to communication, then the more time binding there is, the more progress there is. And the concept of progress is implicit in general semantics ideas. This is a very interesting point. Um, but take <coughs> Korzybski maintained that human progress goes when time binding is functioning well goes by geometrical progression very very rapidly uh, and that's a sign that uh, the time binding is going properly uh, a wonderful example of course in recent years is, is the fact that the first Wright Brothers plane was flown within the lifetime of some of us right here. But but see what think where aviation has got since that time. This is fantastic. But there you have, you know, the the, the rapid <coughs> exchange of technologies and information, just as fast as possible. And it really depressed me. Last year I went to I happened to be in outside of Miami, Florida, and I saw a kind of graveyard of great big beautiful planes and I looked at them and I suddenly realized that they're the Pan American Clippers See? and ten years ago I had gone to Japan in one of those Clippers and thought what a wonderful wonderful plane what a beautiful luxurious thing this is well they're all out of date now and there they are in the graveyard it made me feel very sad uh, <coughs> but but progress is geometrical in any field in which scientific orientations are at work and in which there are no, as I say, no inhibitions to the exchange of information. And notice that when I, when I say there, talk about inhibitions to the exchange of information, there are lots and lots and lots of fields about which, let us say, there is serious inhibition of, the, of uh, exchange of information. One obvious exa example is on the subject of sex. There is no change of exchange of information. There's no rapid dissemination of knowledge on this subject, and so on. And so, uh, knowledge on this subject, on such subjects, uh, remain fairly static. Now, in c the culture-bearing concept of the cultural anthropologists does not pass a value judgment and say one culture is better than another. They say they're all cultures and they're all equally valid. In a curious way, the some of the anthropologists refuse to draw value judgments and say that horse racing and cannibalism and, <laughs> and uh, drilling oil wells and all these various cultural manifestations, one is just as good as another from, from the um, anthropologist's point of view. But the semanticists will say one is better than the other. If time binding is a value, then any cultural habit that inhibits time binding is a negative value. Therefore, censorship, the suppression of information, the lack of freedom of speech, the lack of freedom of press are, are negative inhibitions to time binding and therefore anti time binding, therefore anti civilization. And in a way, this whole concept of time binding says that, you know, that we all get ahead by, by you know, the Americans entertaining un American ideas, the Japanese entertaining un Japanese ideas. <laughs> The French entertaining un-French ideas, and we, we swap, swap ideas in, in enough and rapidly back and forth all over the place. We might all get smart. Uh, static culture, uh, in which um, time binding is definitely inhibited, 
are doomed cultures according to this point of view. And I think it's a very interesting thing. You know, in the, in the history of Japan, one of the most fascinating episodes from the Semanticist point of view is the period from 1620 to 1868, roughly 250 years, in which Japan sealed itself off from the rest of the world, in which foreigners want, no, were not permitted to land in Japan at all, except at, I think, Nagasaki. A few Dutchmen were permit, permitted there, but they weren't permitted inland. And if you were a Japanese and left the country, you were executed on your return. Uh, what was the reason for this? The reason for this was that the Tokugawa shogunate felt that they had a perfect social setup, a real perfect so a feudal society. They didn't want that society disturbed in any way. So they froze, for example, social classes just the way they were. There were peasants and there were farmers and there were artisans and there were merchants and there were samurai and princes and, you know, so on. All this was carefully laid out. They had elaborate rules as to what at what level of society you may wear what and, and be seen in what and what you may do and so on is fantastic set of regulations and communication was very very strictly controlled of course one of the very very important things about communication there was the, the forbidding of travel was that no Japanese should go go to the state of France or, or Spain or England and pick up ideas with which to disrupt this perfect setup so the barrier against un-Japanese ideas was absolute, complete and absolute almost. Another very fascinating thing is, is the way in which communication was inhibited between social classes. If you get too much freedom of communication between social classes, then ultimately the shoemaker not may forget that he's a shoemaker and aspire to be a merchant. The merchant may aspire to be a samurai. So that'll upset the whole damn works. And so you inhibited communication. This way. And... I remember one curious rule that sticks in my mind is that, you know, communications always went from the t top down. And by the way, have you ever thought of etiquette as, as a communication device? When you give an order, uh, you're superior, then you give an order. Uh, the inferior bows like this, says, yes, sir. But to bow like this is, in a way, you see, it, it's a... It, it says something about communication. It says what you say is very important to me. I'm going to do it exactly the way you say. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And these rules were very, very rigid. All the etiquette of the social classes towards each other was, was, was laid on beautifully and rigidly. And this is why Japanese uh, etiquette it seems so compulsively ritualistic to the foreigner. And... Uh, According to Douglas Herring, it wasn't that way before the Tokugawas came along, <laughs> where the Tokugawas really laid it down on the line. And one interesting rule was that you, communication could go from the top down, 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 down to the very peasants, you see. But there couldn't be any communication going up. Uh, you know, you, if you were a peasant, you didn't have any right to say anything to anybody. Um, but the rule was this. Supposing you were in a peasant village and you were terribly unhappy and therefore you wanted to communicate to the feudal lord that, that you were unhappy, there was one condition under which uh, you could make this communication. That is, the peasants would elect a representative to send to the lord and he would deliver his message. But uh, it was understood that the messenger who delivered the message would be beheaded after he delivered it. That sort of cuts off communication. And of course, the I don't want to digress on the subject of Japanese history too much, because but see the whole excitement of the period immediately after 1868. You see, Commodore Perry hit Japan in 1852, and that created a great stir. And young men all over the country said, "Why do we shut ourselves off from the rest of the world?" 
why don't we introduce some un-Japanese ideas, etc., etc. And of course, some of them were beheaded for entertaining such thoughts. But after Commodore Perry landed, you see, this, the ferment was greater and greater. And modern Japan starts specifically, and this, is, this accounts for so much in recent history, specifically with a group of young men, relatively young men, who overthrew the shogunate and put the legitimate emperor back as emperor. And, and then immediately after that, from 1868 on, all young men were encouraged to go abroad and study. You go to America, you go to France, you go to Italy, you go to Russia, you go to Germany, see, and learn something and bring it back. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We're hundreds of years behind the time. And that was the order of the emperor. And of course, I mentioned my, my father, my father's passion for English literature is partly the result of this whole ferment in Japan, see, in the latter part of the 19th century, in the whole interest in, the, in foreign ideas. And the men of that generation, as I say, were real liberals in a very important sense. That is, they were internationalist in outlook. And it was only in the 1930s that this, this crowd of so-called elder statesmen who were, took the... were, I found it a disadvantage. Many of them were assassinated by younger people and uh, other unfortunate things in the history of Japan resulted. But anyway, this bad matter of objection to un-American ideas or un-Japanese ideas or whatsoever is a very interesting point, is that, see, in, in a sense... In a sense, time binding for most people in the world, in the world's history, is from one's direct cultural ancestors. And therefore, there is the fear of the stranger and the fear of, of outside ideas, and the, a prejudice we inherit still from this stage of culture, when time binding was largely within the tri tribal group, results in the fact that the outsider, the worshiper of strange gods, remains an object of fear. And I am amazed at the degree to which uh, we still suffer from this. All the people who, for example, object to the United States being a member of the United Nations and think what a terrible thing that is. You know what is in the American and the United Nations? A bunch of damn foreigners. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, but the fear of the foreigner is still very, very lively. I'm mean, always amazed at that. Now, because of this general time-binding theory, I think the student of general semantics will tend to support all idea those ideals of international and cultural cooperation, such are held as are held by people of goodwill of many different faiths and, nas faiths and nationalities all over the world. I think we would naturally tend to support such things for the United Nations, which transcends the limited time binding of national groups to a world time binding. Pooling of material resources, intellectual resources, and so on from all over the world is one of the ideals of the United Nations, and I would think it should be one of our ideals too. We would tend, as citizens, the general semanticists, I think, would tend to oppose political thought control wherever it may arise, because thought control is the antithesis of, of time binding. One would, one would oppose also racial and religious discrimination, not simply out of democratic sentiment, but also out of a conviction that the fullest time binding necessitates freest cultural interchange between all races and creeds and classes. He would support freedom of press, speech, an assembly, not solely because he's culturally conditioned to do so as we are here, but also because he would hold theoretically that such restrictions of these freedoms are denials of the cultural process, the time-binding process. The definition of man as time-binder then gives the general semanticist a kind of ethical basis upon which, from which cultures, including his own, may be criticized and evaluated. And, of course, because this value, value judgment is implicit in general semantics, see, it is very uh, widely rejected in 
more conservative academic circles is not a science at all because science shouldn't have these value judgments. Well, I'm not sure it should, they shouldn't. Anyway, central to general semantics, however, is, is an attitude towards science. The science, in the view of the general semanticist, is the outstanding example of time-binding behavior. Now, all problem solving requires making some kind of maps of the territories of human experience. If we wish to build a bridge, we must know something about the properties of the materials used, the characteristics of the river to be bridged. If we wish to rule a nation, we have to know something about the people in it, their habits and desires, and the resources available to satisfy their needs, and so on. And whether we successfully build a bridge or govern a nation depends on the accuracy of our map making. Now, there are two facets of science. First is the systematization of certain habits common to at least a part of the problem-solving behavior of all people in all cultures, namely observing, checking, making hypotheses, and testing them. And secondly, it's the systematization of methods whereby such perceptions may be shared. See, in order that any number of observers may communicate with each other and exchange reports, Fundamental science is a body of linguistic agreements, linguistic conventions, such as, for example, system of chemical symbols, systems of mathematics, systems of weights and measures, systems of scientific nomenclature. All these are standardized and agreed upon. Thus, because we do this, observations can be compared, experiments can be repeated, errors can be checked, and information can be accumulated. It's interesting to think of science as a huge cooperative enterprise of human beings jointly trying to make better and better, better maps of reality. Now, sometimes motives from outside of science, such as commercial rivalry or military rivalry, may interfere with the free exchange of ideas and information. Nevertheless, science offers the outstanding example in world history of international intellectual cooperation. And one way of saying it is a science is an institutionalization of time-binding habits. And science is, as always, as truthful as it can be, and it does not have any courts of law to enforce truthfulness. It's curious that there's a community that governs itself without any machinery of punishing those who violate the rules, <laughs> except the fact that he ceases to be called a scientist anymore. But it's not only the institutionalization of time-binding habits. Science is interesting also because it institutionalized all, uh, institutionalizes also the avoidance of those cultural or private habits of evaluation that hinder or limit time-binding. And therefore, the culture pattern of the scientific world is not just another culture pattern to be evaluated as no better or no worse than the kinship system of the Australian Aborigines, or the potlatch of the quadrupedal, the culture pattern of the scientific world is rather a systematic selection of prevailing patterns of culture, of those specific ways of ab abstracting, and those specific forms of linguistic behavior that guarantee the maximum of human agreement, so that people can go on from there. So I want you to think then of science not in terms of specific sciences of chemistry, of nuclear physics, or whatever, but of science as a technique of agreement. And when you think of it this way, science is far from being limited to the laboratory or the test tube. Science is a technique of agreement, perhaps the greatest we have, and certainly the only one which has been strongly enough internationalized and institutionalized to have an almost universal prestige. Now, it's the position of general semanticists that the orientation of science, not the content itself of science so much as the orientation of science, which is central, or central to which is the determination to find grounds for agreement and then to go on together from there. 
such an orientation need not be confined to scientists, indeed must not be confined to scientists. Of course, scientists themselves fail to exhibit such an orientation outside the laboratory, nor are they uniformly successful in exhibiting it within. Nevertheless, the main features of a scientific orientation, which is what general semantics try to train us in, can be easily described. In addition to the desire for agreement, there's its essential democracy, which resides in the fact that all may contribute to science what they can and take from it what they need. The science does not work by, let's say, prestige system. You know, a part-time laboratory assistant, if he makes an observation that no one else has made, it's legitimate, even if he hasn't got his PhD yet. So any, anyone can contribute what he knows. And uh, there's an essential democracy of knowledge, of contribution there, and anyone can take from what they need. And a related feature of science is the fact that all scientific statements are always open to challenge. See, in politics, in religion, in all sorts of fields of knowledge and activity, you have certain statements, you say, were made by such and such a great man, and therefore you mustn't question it. It was said by Hitler, therefore you must not question it. It was said by Muhammad, therefore you must not question it. It was said by Jesus, therefore you must not question it. But in science, you, know, you can't you can say it was said by Sir Isaac Newton, said by Einstein. And the scientist said, well, so what? <laughs> uh, we have to go on from there. We have to refute it, if it's refutable, and find a more general principle. And therefore, in science, as Wendell Johnson said, there's never the last word, there's only the latest. <laughs> because time binding is a process without end. Conditions change, the earth changes, human needs change, and the boundaries of knowledge change. So that even the most established of scientific truths inevitably need, sooner or later, modification or revision. Many of us are old enough to remember learning in school that the atom could not, not be split. Remember? Some of us can remember this far back. We just assume that, you know, that's the, the atom means, you know, A meaning not and T-O-M means cut. Atom means that which cannot be cut, cannot, cannot be split. And of course, obviously, it's been done. And scientists, and therefore, if, if there is no, uh, there's never the last word in science, but only the latest, then the a central fact about a scientist, then, is that he must continue all his life to be accessible to new information, information that may upset what he already thinks he knows. The ability to listen, the ability to, to take in new information, is central to the orientation of science. Now notice it isn't central to the orientation of people in many, many walks of life. I mean, a preacher can... 30 years after graduation from theological school, believe exactly what he believed when he graduated. In fact, he ought to, for the <laughs> orientation of many churches, you see. And it doesn't, and, and he, remains, he remains a preacher. No one questions his ability or questions his credentials. I think that, um, that in many fields of knowledge, uh, people cling to, con to conviction and are often admired for it in politics, in religion, in many other fields of human endeavor. But in science, you don't cling to your conviction. You have to retain always the idea to take in that kind of information that may very well upset your lifetime investment in a body of theory. But nevertheless, you still remain open. And in advocating the orientation of science, then, we're not saying, in general semantics, that everyone should study physics or mathematics or chemistry. It's possible for some people to spend a lifetime in the physical sciences without ever acquiring a scientific orientation about other things. The scientific orientation may be acquired with or without training in the sciences. Indeed, some people acquire it without any schooling at all. Now, this orientation might have been called the political orientation or the philosophical orientation if it had been first institutionalized by politicians or philosophers, but it wasn't. It was institutionalized first by scientists. 
Now, in order to make clear what I mean by the scientific orientation, then let me contrast it with some other orientations. If people do not have the attitudes of an earnest desire for agreement, if they are not content with small agreements on the basis of which to make larger agreements later. You know, don't you, that, that, that science talks about apparently trivial things, an obvious thing, and step, goes step by step by step from the trivial and the obvious to the more general and to the more general and the more general. If people are not scientific in orientation, if they are not willing to listen, if they do not have a respect for facts arrived at by any number of independent observers and the ability to correct generalizations in the light of new information, what are the alternative attitudes people are likely to have? Now, I would like to describe some of the alternative orientations. One of these, obviously, is the orientation of dependency, in which statements are accepted not because they're verifiable, not even because they're logically consistent, but because they originate from a parent or parent substitute. And this parent or parent substitute may take the form of a <coughs> actual father or a professor, an employer, a political leader, or at a more abstract level, it may take the form of a philosophical system, a sacred book, or maybe even a hundred sacred books. And the general motto of this orientation may be stated very simply. It's true because Daddy says so. And with his orientation, widespread human agreement would be possible if and only if everybody in the world accepted the same parent figure as authority. It's very interesting to realize that Many, many of the bloodiest wars in history have been motivated by a desire to make peace. And you see, the idea is that if you, we'll, we'll, we'll create peace, be peace by having everyone obey the one ruler. Napoleon, Hitler, whoever, Genghis Khan. And obviously we'd have peace if we all agreed to accept the rule of Genghis Khan. But since human history has been very pessimistic as to the possibility of all human beings agreeing on one ruler, this theory of, of agreement is not a very hopeful one. Another pre-scientific orientation is word-mindedness as opposed to fact-mindedness, the tendency to verbal mania. And among the sta unstated assumptions of this orientation are the following. If a statement sounds true, it must be true. If it is eloquently stated in a beautiful voice, it must be true. Um, or a more subtle one is, if, the state if a statement logically follows from self-evident premises, it must be true. Uh, words are remarkably intoxicating things. A flood of oratory is able to produce a mild jag in most people. <laughs> and some orators, such as Adolf Hitler, were able to produce much more than a mild jag. Uh, in the technical literature of general semantics, we use the term intentional orientation, I-N-T-E-N-S-I-O-N-A-L, as opposed to extensional orientation, to describe verbal mania as opposed to fact mind. I think that this is the, uh, the uh, prevailing sin of intellectuals. See, in addition to the mass hysteria produced by verbal manic demagogues, there's a more dignified kind of spellbinding produced by what may be called the scholastic tradition. <laughs> the Greeks who were an in inexhaustibly loquacious people seem to have started it. <laughs> And it was their assumption that if people argued and talked long enough about something, the truth would emerge. And 
Putting statements to operational tests was something that rarely occurred to them. Perhaps because they were not accustomed to using their hands. Because they had slaves do all their work for them. I don't think we really thought hard enough about the fact that the whole of this great, great Greek civilization rested upon a system of slavery. And all the great Greek philosophers that we talked about you know, wouldn't have been wouldn't have been caught dead with a shovel in his hand you know, <laughs> or doing something useful. It was a caste bar to do everything by talking because physical labor was done by slaves. Now, the inheritors of this garrulous tradition do not, to this day, put propositions to operational tests. We are all in Western civilization inheritors of this tradition. And therefore, we all have within us, especially if we've gotten into college, we all have within us, in some respects, an, an excessive susceptibility to resounding and erudite phrases whose meaninglessness is obscured by their respectability in learned discourse. <laughs> I want to digress for a moment at this point to tell you something about the position of Karl Popper, you know, the philosopher at the University of London who wrote a very, very famous book, The Open Society and Its Enemies. That was first published, I think, in about 1950, and it always amazes me that a book as technical as that has, has had the influence it has, because everybody uses the word the open society versus the closed society now. I mean, it was even used in the Eisenhower administration, you know, as, as a description of certain types of society, and that we are an open society and so on. Well, this is Karl Popper, okay talked about this. And he says at one point, he talking specifically about about the kind of of academic discipline taught in which there's an enormous amount of meaningless verbiage. But you have to you know, memorize it and get your master's degree and your PhD in this stuff. He said it is a crime to teach this it destroys the minds of young people. It destroys the minds of young people. When he told me this, I saw him a couple of years ago when he came through here. He said this to me in conversation. He said it with such, you know, passion and conviction that to teach some of the real junk that's being taught <laughs> in our colleges is very serious. It really destroys the minds of young people. It fills them up with whole body of abstractions which are never going to be any use but nevertheless it'll get them jobs as professors you see. and then they go on to destroy more minds uh, it's a terrifying concept but when I say talk about destroying minds see, I'm, talk I'm thinking specifically who's got a copy of language and thought and action uh, I am very distressed at the present time talking about destroying minds with uh, the fad for existentialism. I must confess that I, it really bugs me. Um, at the heart of existentialism, I think, are some important truths. But the prose style of most existentialists, especially the ones with the highest prestige, is fantastically nonsensical. Let me read you a passage it's quoted here. The being that exists is man. Man alone exists. Rocks are, but they do not exist. Trees are, but they do not exist. Horses are, but they do not exist. Angels are, but they do not exist. God is, but he does not exist. The proposition man alone exists does not mean by any means that man alone is a real being while other things are unreal or mere appearances or human ideas, the proposition man exists means man is that being whose being is distinguished by the open standing standing in of the unconcealedness of being. <laughs> don't laugh, I haven't got the end of the sentence. <laughs> man is that being whose being is 
is distinguished by the opening, open standing, standing in, in the unconcealedness of being, from being, in being. The existential nature of man is the reason why a man can represent beings as such, and why he can, he can be conscious of them. All consciousness presupposes ecstatically understood existence as the essentia of man. Essentia meaning that as which man is present insofar as he is man. <laughs> but consciousness does not itself create the openness of beings, nor is it consciousness that makes it possible for man to stand open for beings. Whither and whence and in what three dimension could the intentionality of consciousness move? if instancy were not the essence of man in the first instance. <laughs> oh, there's some great stuff in that book. Would <laughs> 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 that be written away? Yeah. 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 That's a translation from the German. It's from Heidegger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, What happens to you, see, what happens to you, and, and Hans Reichenbach has written on this subject, what happens to you is, supposing this sort of a reading, volumes of it, is assigned to you by your professors. And, you know, you're young and innocent and don't know from nothing. See? This book comes to you with great, great prestige then, from a prestigeful professor. And you memorize it, and you learn it, and you read it, and you read it. It doesn't make any sense. But nevertheless, you know, you feel that it's got to have some meaning, otherwise they wouldn't assign it here at this great university, <coughs> or as a required reading. See? So you, you read it long enough until you finally persuade yourself that it does mean something. <laughs> and notice that if you persuade yourself successfully, <coughs> and are able to write this kind of stuff, for your final exam and get an A, you are rewarded, and so you suddenly realize, well, goodness, I must be an existentialist. It must be great stuff. I get an A in it. <laughs> and so you go on and, be, and go to graduate school. <laughs> you learn more and get, get your doctorate and learn more and more of this. And I don't know. Another orientation that is an alternative to the scientific is the orientation of mysticism, which is usually an extreme form of verbal mania. And here I know I tread on disputed ground, but the mystic seems to me to be the man who talks to himself and others of a like mind in a language comprehensible only to himself, but which nevertheless of course, seems to afford him a great deal of inward satisfaction. This language is usually extremely highfalutin and often meaningless, in which case it's simply another case of verbal mania. But, you see, mysticism always provides some problems. Sometimes the language of the mystic appears to stand for something quite real in his experience some kind of events or perceptions for which common language has no name or no vocabulary. In such a case, and I think this so often of uh, many forms of oriental mysticism, the mystic seems to be spraying around a large number of words at random in the hope that some of them will hit the target. You know, you you're just a vague, unverbalizable experience, and you can't hit it exactly with a word. So you, you do this sort of shotgun technique of spraying all words all over in that direction. Uh, and here, so here is always left with the question, is there a target at all? <laughs> and I suppose if there is a target, <coughs> 
real target. What the mystic says today may be the subject of science tomorrow. Maybe. But the trouble with mystical language and most of the people who use it is that whether or not it stands for something, many people of this orientation refuse to look for more verifiable ways of stating the same thing. They become kind of addicted to the special vocabulary of that cult. I'm not talking about general semantics. <laughs> 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 Or am I? <laughs> but from, the, from my immediate point of view here, it suffices to say that the trouble with mystical language, whether or not it stands for something, is that it is inca incapable of producing human agreement. And the criticism to be made of most mystics is that they show little, dispos little disposition towards revising their language in ways that might enhance the possibilities of sharing their perceptions with others. Now, another orientation alternative to the scientific is the orientation of wishful thinking. According to this point of view, whatever we want passionately enough to be so, is so. This orientation is one greatly encouraged by most of the major forces of public opinion, including especially the dream factories of advertising in the movies. You remember James Thurber's famous short story, The Secret World of Walter Mitty? And this describes, you remember, the, the absurd and unrealistic daydreaming of a very ineffectual man. Well, I think it's very important what Hollywood did to it. You remember the movie version of this? All these dreams are made to come true. <laughs> and Mr. Thurber protested in vain. <laughs> in Hollywood, he said, look, you lost out my story. That's not the story at all. But from Hollywood's point of view, it is. It's got to be the story. People have these dreams and they all come true. The moral of the movie seems to be that we should all believe what we want to believe, no matter how improbable, and our faith will be rewarded. But many, there can be many criticisms of this orientation to be made, political, economic, or psychiatric. But for our present purposes, it's sufficient to point out that the orientation of wishful thinking does not lead to human agreement. Now another orientation that fascinates me very much, and I think that many of us right here have it, is what I call the yes but orientation. It's the orientation of people who, on the whole, like to make verifiable statements, to seek languages in which agreement is possible, and in every way behave like good time binders, except when they arrive at certain subjects involving their special moral, philosophical, cultural, or class prejudices, at which point they dig their heels in the ground and say, yes, but, and this orientation is extremely common. And no doubt it's been encouraged by the many crude misapplications of what looks like science to areas where those particular scientific methods are not altogether appropriate. The most dignified manifestation of this yes but orientation is to be found, for example, in Ralph Waldo Emerson's classic statement that there be two laws, a law for man, a law for thing. And things, in other words, can be classified and sorted and stated and, and described and so on in scientific language. The law for man is one in which you cannot use simply the language of science. It's something higher involved. Uh, everything in the universe except man, then, is discussable according to this view by science, which is the law for thing. And the law for man is something else to be discussed by other methods. Now, this may be true. There are some many, indeed, many shortcomings to the language of science. Uh, when you discuss human problems, especially our own. <coughs> now, I shall not presume to say exactly what Emerson meant by a statement, but those who make a motto of this statement, I, refer, I, I think especially of um, the literary humanists of a few years ago, 
they use this motto of Emerson, there be two laws discreet, the law for man and the law for thing. They use this formulation not only as a way of throwing out science, but a way of throwing out the scientific orientation as well. In fact, that you make of this a quite quite a strong anti-scientific weapon. But supposing you do throw out the scientific orientation, what are you left with? You're left with the daddy says so orientation, or intentional orientation, or orientation by verbal auto intoxication. <laughs> you're left with a mystical orientation, or that you're left with the orientation of wishful thinking. And these seem to be the only alternatives if you really throw out scientific orientation. Hence, philosophical dualists and other yes-butters are destined, at whatever point they say yes-but, to have some area of their thinking in which their orientations preclude the possibility of sober agreement. So what we call in general semantics the scientific orientation then is not a matter of logarithms or test tubes or betatrons or of the paraphernalia of science. It's not even an attitude of cold scientific detachment as is popularly believed. See, the notion that science and reason are cold and cold is a superstition engendered by the fact that since the more spectacular forms of unscientific behavior are extremely uh, hot and impetuous, it is assumed that its opposite must be cold and detached. But as you all know, extremely scientific behavior, unscientific behavior can also be cold and detached. In fact, indeed, it can become routine. As anyone can testify who has seen the slow bureaucracy or railroad ticket office at work. <laughs> now, the essential of scientific orientation is simply then one, the determination to find bases of agreement and to go on together from there. And this would require a concomitant degree of intellectual and emotional flexibility. <clears throat> Second, the willingness to put statements to operational tests of some kind. And three, the internalization of the knowledge that there's something more to be learned about everything, so that one always remains capable of listening. Indeed, the orientation of science are merely the orientation of sanity, which is the meaning of the title of Korzybski's book, Science and Sanity. <clears throat> and sanity, so defined, is necessary in every field of human activity. Now, having stated all this, I want to give a specific and particular example of what I think is this scientific orientation exhibited on a community scale. <clears throat> the district in Chicago in which I lived for 16 years or so, near the University of Chicago, is known as Hyde Park. And immediately to the north of Hyde Park is Kenwood. Now the Hyde Park Kenwood area was known in the late 1940s as a transitional area, which is a polite way of saying it was on the road to becoming a slum. <clears throat> Faced with this fact, a number of concerned people at the Quaker Church, University of Kessler, Chicago and others start to have meetings on the subject and Professor Herbert Thielen, T-H-E-L-E-N of the University Department of Education and the Social Co Order Committee of the 57th Street meeting of friends with Reverend Leslie Pennington of, of the Unitarian Church as well Thomas Wright of the Mayor's Commission on Human Relations, Earl Dickerson of the Chicago Urban League, a number of people like that began to have meetings. Yeah, a rabbi and Mrs. Uh, Jacob Weinstein were involved in this too. The real leaders of the community. And in 1949, they started an organization called the Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference. And the purpose of the, con of the conference was to stop neighborhood deterioration and the flight to the suburbs and to create, if possible, an, an interracial community that all the residents could be, could continue to be proud of. Because, you know, this was, was a real good neighborhood, Hyde Park, Kenwood. Now, I want to tell you something about the way in which this thing was operated. 
people living in a single block were the basic units in which the conference was organized. The work began with block meetings, meetings of people who were mostly strangers to each other, as they are in a big city, you know, but who were united by some common problem. For example, in one block, there would be concern about purse snatchings taking place because the streets were not well enough lit. <coughs> in another block, people were upset because Negroes had moved into one of the houses. Or in another block, there were problems of unsatisfactory garbage removal or inadequate play space for children or unsightly old cars abandoned in the streets or illegal conversions, especially, of one family residence into small kitchenette apartments that you know, let out for a lot more money. And these illegal conversions all usually, you know, uh, violated all sorts of local building laws and so on. Now, in these meetings, Herb, Herb Thielen formulated certain rules of discourse for the conduct of the discussion. First of all, ideological discussions were strictly avo avoided. For example, where strictly avoided whether in a democracy one should or should not segregate Negroes and you know, why. This is an abstract question, a high level of abstraction. You couldn't discuss it. It kept you off of it altogether. And secondly, no attempt was made to change prejudices or to question basic attitudes. No attempt was made in that direction specifically. Meetings were directed, first of all, at the lowest level of descriptive abstraction to getting an accurate account of conditions that people were concerned about. The investigating committees were appointed and sent out to look for more facts when information was lacking. And a very, very serious attempt was made to evaluate rumors and see if there was any foundation for them in fact. And they were not acted upon until the rumors were verified. And most rumors proved to be unfounded but, you know, when rumors begin to spread, you know, this is, uh, if they're frightening enough, people just move to the suburbs without checking. <laughs> this is the kind of situation it was. And the mere act of establishing facts dispelled many of the anxieties that made the meetings necessary. And sometimes the allaying of false rumors had the effect of changing the minds of people who had impulsively decided to sell their property and move to the suburbs. I remember one very specific story about this on the 5700 block on Maryland Avenue in Chicago where people were in a great stew because it was known that an Negro family had purchased one of the houses. And the rumors going around were that uh, this was a big <coughs> Negro racketeer, or so another rumor was that he was going to convert this from a, from a residence into a gambling joint or a barbecue stand or something, all kinds of rumors. You know? And the rumors about uh, the fact he was going to break it up and and rent out rooms to lots of other people, making make kitchenette apartments, and so on. It was very funny, the number of rumors that went around. And the, and the people of that block simply had a meeting, and I remember Herb Thielen describing this meeting. He said, before we started the formal meeting, we sort of milled around and got acquainted. And one man started and sounded off, I think, what we ought to do with the niggers is send them all back to Africa. <laughs> nice little statements like that. <laughs> and then, of course, there'd be uh, liberal people there who, you know, who would get very, very angry, and and the meeting threatened almost immediately to become a brawl. So. And Mr. Stephen pulled the meeting together and said, uh, "Let's not discuss our prejudices or, or attitudes. Let's just discuss what the situation is." Now, we understand the Negro family has moved into 5743 or whatever the number was. What's his name? Nobody knew. How many children do they have in their family? Nobody knew. And so on. And so they said, who was it that said they were going to take in rumors and, and fill the place up with colored people? Who, who, who did you hear that, Joe? Because Joe had been just saying that. And Joe said, well, I think Frank told me. Oh, Frank, where did you hear this? <laughs> and so on. And as they went round and round the room, they picked up many more rumors, but no one could find out where they came from. 
So finally they said, well, let's appoint a fact-finding committee and go over and call on the man and find out these things. And so they went over and some of them went to call on the man. And the man said, uh, introduced himself, introduced his wife, introduced his children. And uh, they said to him as politely as possible, you know, we haven't had a Negro family in this block before, and some people are a little upset about it, but we'd like to know as much as we can about you. So we can tell people. What are your plans for your building? And the man went to his desk door and pulled out a great wad of blueprints. I said, we're going to remodel them. And this is what we're going to do with the house. And they were going to really make a pretty nice house out of it. He said, you don't intend to take anybody else in? As rumors? Of course not. Sir. We've been looking all our lives for a house like this instead of being crowded in the Negro ghetto where we have to live with other people. We finally found that we're going to keep it to ourselves. And this is what we're going to do with the living room and this is what we're going to do with the dining room and so on and so on. They were going to spend a lot of money on it. Before this meeting took place, four houses on that, on that block, Stephen said, had been placed on the market. And then they had another meeting at which the facts were reported as to what this man intended to do, and those four houses were taken off the market the following day. There's no at attempt to change attitudes at the higher level. You just get enough facts and, and certain conclusions emerge. Well, as a result of the activities of the conference, interesting things began to happen in Hyde Park and Kenwood. Well, one of the very funny things that happened was, you see, uh, when a neighborhood is changing, you know one of the very, very slick techniques is, is to take, let's say, a ten-room apartment. There are lots of be big, beautiful apartments like that there. And then cut them up into, into you know, uh, four or five two-room apartments. And to do this, of course, you usually had, you had to put, after all, a bath and, and a kitchen and a little kind of electric stove or something in each of these little apartments. And in order to do this, you usually had to violate a large number of city ordinances. This that matter of illegal conversion was a very, very hot issue. And by the time the Hyde Park Kenwood Conference really got going, no one could so much as hammer a picture into the wall, you know, mm -hmm. without the neighbors hearing it and reporting it to the High Park Park Kenwood Conference and say, is there an illegal conversion going on at such and such an address on Drexel? And they would send someone around to find out. And it became practically impossible, you know, to carry some lumber into your house without people raising this question. And they really put a stop to illegal conversion in a big way. Oh, there's, there's so many fascinating stories that came out of there. There's hundreds of these stories, but for example, when, when one building, uh, one block, I told you they had two men's purse snatching because it was a dark street. And they just, all they had did was to have a meeting and they said, let's leave our front porch lights on all night. That's all they agreed upon. They all did that, up and down that street. And automatically took care of that problem. <laughs> And there was another fascinating story that um, of, um, the, <clears throat> the real problem here is that when Negroes buy into a block or the block is kicked over, as they say, <laughs> one of the very interesting things is that city services decline. They used to inform, uh, enforce zoning laws. They used to, to enforce laws governing illegal conversions. But once Negroes move in, they stop enforcing any of those laws. That's one of the reasons these things deteriorate so fast. One thing they did, in, particularly in Chicago, was the sanitation department wouldn't pick up the gar bar garbage conscientiously after Negroes had taken over a block as they did when white people were there. And one block, in, they were very, very highly aware of this fact, and they were mostly Negroes in that block now, I see, and the garbage collection deteriorated terribly, and so they had a meeting once at a corner drugstore, and everybody went in turn in the phone booth to call the sanitation department city hall. So that, that morning they had about 40 telephone calls saying, what's the matter with the garbage collection at such and such an, an address on, on Greenwood Avenue or whatever? <coughs> 
the next day a whole bunch of garbage trucks out there. <laughs> you know? This is uh, and this kind of cooperation at the very, 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 very um, elementary level, if you was what emerged. For example, in, well, I don't need to go on, but I mean, I know that that uh, making a, a, a play, um, what they call tot lots. You know what they are? The little play yards for little tots. You know? And the neighbors would get together and, you know, find out who owned this vacant lot, and then they'd get permission to make a tot lot there for all the kids in the district, and so on. All sorts of things like this went on. Now, <coughs> together the block organizations learned how to start to, to exert collective pressure on the city hall for better policing, better enforcement of zoning laws, and general improvement of the committee. But if you want to know the rest of this story, I refer you to two books. One called The Dynamics of Groups at Work by Herbert Thielen, and another one called A Neighborhood Finds Itself by Julia Abramson. Julia Abramson was uh, the executive director for some years of the Hyde Park Kenwood Conference. Well, at a meeting of the Society for General Semantics in Chicago in 1954 or thereabouts, Herb Thielen gave an account of the technique of block meetings of Hyde Park Kenwood. And a friend of mine remarked as he left the lecture hall, by gosh, that is semantics in action. Well, I think it is, because the block meetings of the Hyde Park Kenwood Conference were an impressive demonstration in action of the principles of communication which I think <laughs> general semantics is about. Kwasinski used to talk about the natural order of evaluation. Namely, you start from the description to the generalization to the inference to the higher order abstraction. And this is exactly what they did. They started with the descriptive level. What are conditions in this block? How many times do they collect the garbage? How many illegal conversions are going on in that apartment building? And they get the facts first, and then from there on, the solutions would emerge. And the whole secret of, of the conference lay in start, starting the, the discussions at the lowest levels of abstraction, and then going on to general topics having to do with city ordinances, zoning laws, and the like. In contrast to the foregoing, there's the position of Richard Weaver, for example, who was at the University of Chicago at that time, and I think he's probably still there, asserting the necessity of metaphysical agreement before any other communication can be established. This is the one that's classic philosophy talk about. He wrote in a book published in 1949, how can men who disagree about what the world is, is for agree about the minutiae of daily conduct? That's a wonderful question. How can men who disagree about what the world is for agree about the minutiae of daily conduct? Do we have to agree as to what the world is for, <laughs> I mean, who made it and for what purpose, before we can agree on garbage collection? <laughs> now his prescription apparently, according to Louis we was to concentrate on the attainment of metaphysical agreement, which is the most important agreement of all, according to Weaver. Well, he, he, his, according to his pres prescription, we would concentrate on the attainment of metaphysical agreement and let the garbage accumulate. <laughs> and when the accumulation becomes intolerable to move to the suburbs. <laughs> so, ultimately, so ultimately the suburbs become intolerable too. It, you see, I, I mentioned earlier uh, an attitude towards scholastic philosophy. Uh, and, and I mention this because it because it is a philosophical position that, that I'm very, very much in opposition to. Let me t tell you about another distinguished figure in scholastic philosophy who was at the University of Chicago at that time. Julia Abramson writes, On March 17, 1950, a committee of three from the Hyde Park Kenwood Conference met with top university officials. The meeting was distinguished chiefly for its brevity. After listening to a quick review of our program and the work of the conference, Chancellor Robert Maynard Hutchins announced that he was going to have to do what he so frequently had to do because of his busy schedule, namely make a statement of his own position and then leave for another appointment. <laughs> he, met, 
<laughs> he made an excellent declaration of principle on the race issue and then began to put on his hat and coat that one of the American committee members afterwards. It was only after a change of administration at the University of Chicago that they got the university's cooperation with that of the Park Kimmich Conference. Now, what were the results of communication processes initiated and organized by the Hyde Park Kenwood Conference? Mrs. Abramson tells the following story of results by 1959. An increasing number of citizens now see deterioration rather than race as a chief enemy. And this realization came as they realized with the in-migration of southern rural whites that lack of urbanization created the problems regardless of whether the people were white or negro. And I don't know if you know about this, but in Chicago there's been an enormous migration of white uh, southerners of the agricultural kind from Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, the usual term is hillbillies. But they are a real problem in Chicago, and uh, all the problems that have been attributed to Negroes, they have created. <laughs> <laughs> they, they create exactly the same kind of conditions because they are unurbanized. Mm -hmm. this is the, what, what they used to say about Negroes, they throw their garbage out of the window and on the street below. Well, these white people are actually doing this, you know. <laughs> and they would take, let's say, they would wreck a car and they take it all apart and use up all the usable parts for to put together another car. And then they leave the wreck right in the street and walk away. And... Uh, it, all sorts of things went and of course they would get into awful brawls and nightings and fights at every tavern it was really so funny I think that uh, Chicago learned a lot from these white southerners that um, about about sociology you see, as a factor rather than race a warm new spirit of kinship is abroad the feeling that we are all in this together the community of 1949, Im immobilized by fear and anxiety, lethargy and pessimism, is immobilized no longer. Confidence and optimism are evident in conversation, in public meetings, and in the fact that present residents have decided to remain and have invested money in the area. The Hyde Park Kenwood Conference is now generally accepted as a potent force by all community interests. The Southeast Chicago Commission and an, an influential constitu constituency adds urgently needed strength. The most powerful ally now is the University of Chicago with its great prestige and assets. Now fully committed to preserving, a, to com preserving the community, improving it, and being a leading factor in it. The churches and the temples, the PTAs, the businessmen associations, the Hyde Park Herald, the community newspaper, the education institutions and hospitals are all involved in greater or lesser degree. So are Chicago's mayor, the community's two aldermen, every department of city government, state and federal bodies, all putting tremendous resources into Hyde Park Kenwood as Chicago's first urban renewal area. Now, to go back to this matter of science. Science has been the one field of human activity in which the sharing of perceptions and making publicly confirmable statements the discipline progress from lower to higher levels of abstraction and the determination to build a larger agreement on the basis of smaller agreements. All these are institutionalized in science. And these are the rules for the organization of communication. In the work of the Hyde Park Community Conference, we have another perhaps less systematic but no less genuine application of scientific time-binding orientation to the clarification and solution of social problems. The Greek philosopher Sprato, who is credited with being the founder of physics, started his demonstrations by proving that air is a material substance by performing a little experiment with a vessel of water. He started at a very low level of abstraction. The Hyde Park Kenwood Community uh, Conference started out at a similar level of abstraction by talking about kitchenette apartments and abandoned cars. Both communication systems, don't you see, start with shared perceptions at the lowest levels of abstraction and then go on from there. Not shared ideologies, not shared words, shared perceptions. That is, you may be Catholic and I Protestant, 
But we both look at that abandoned car in the middle of our street and say, somebody should do something about it. Then the meeting says, well, why don't you? In a pluralistic society, such as we have in America, we have learned, especially in our cities, how to get along with each other through the sharing of perceptions. Catholics and Protestants and Jews in our mixed societies get along by avoiding confronting e with each other with theological differences and sharing perceptions as members of the same office force, teaching staff, or bowling team. In a pluralistic world, nations get along together by respecting each other's cultural differences and cooperating on what might be called international housekeeping. For example, the, inter the enforcement of international maritime regulations, agreements on postal exchange, agreements on the extradition of pri prisoners, the creation of international systems of air traffic control, rights of navigation, and all the other minutiae of international housekeeping. Now, sometimes people ask if it is not possible that some unscrupulous person possessing great knowledge of communicative theory through general semantics might not use that knowledge as a means of taking advantage of others. Such an outcome would hardly seem possible to me because general semantics can involve no such separation of ends and means. In the general semantics theory of time binding, the end is in the means, and the means are part of the end. The mutual in enrichment that we arrive at by communication, my perceptions being corrected and enriched by yours, and yours being corrected and enriched by mine. These are the piece-by-piece -piece realization of that communion among men that has been dreamed of by the great ethical leaders throughout history who have been creating and improving systems of human communication and cooperation. From the builders of the prehistoric burial mounds to the founders of the great religions and great empires, and the creators of creators of science and the scientific tradition. All of these people, after all, have been interested in communication cooperation in various ways. At the, at the stage of cultural development, which I like to call the stage of the shared perception, the goal we are striving for is not the triumph of one ideology over another, of one worldview over another. It's merely the establishment of enough shared perceptions among all, all people about commonplace things, such as food, shelter, housing, waterways, maritime laws, fishing rights, tariffs and trade, the necessity of slowing down the international armaments race. So that even if we differ about the nature of God, <laughs> that we can get together on air traffic control. We can get together on tariff agreement. We, it's not necessary to achieve this metaphysical agreement that the scholastics talk about. And even if we differ about larger and more abstract matters, we shall not have to go to war about these differences. Well, what I'm saying then is the task of general semantics is to advance time binding. And if, my, if enough people in enough places are enabled through the study of general semantics or anything else to acquire the orientations of science with respect to our most pressing problems, artistic, political, ethical, as well as scientific and technical, then a time may be envisioned when groups, classes, and even nations might begin to listen to each other with the specific intent of, intent of finding even small areas of agreement upon which larger agreements can gradually be built. If such a time ever arrives, it will not come just because we desire it or pray for it. It will only come if enough people discipline themselves in the avoidance of those specific orientations that inevitably lead to failures in communication and therefore to disagreement. And it's interesting to note that the training of counselors, for example, in Carl Rogers' client center th therapy can be described in general semantics terms as consisting in large part of training in the avoidance of just those reactions that cut off communication. And that's why that theory is so important to us. And in group dynamics, which can be described as small-scale time-binding. The training of group leaders is training of the same kind. And no doubt there are many other disciplines in which, which have likewise found ways of making operative in everyday life the orientations of science. It is finally, therefore, the task of general semantics not only to create, to promote time-binding in its own way, but to promote it by systematizing and disseminating knowledge 
Of those rising psychological, biological, and social disciplines, which are each in their own way increasing the total amount of time binding in the world. Well, thank you very much. Let's take a break. <laughs>